Coming soon to a theater near you. Yo, 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 yo. Episode 6 of The Real Ones Podcast with myself, Mr. Marin, and my main man over here. My main man, 150 grand, RB3. What's good with you, RB? What's good, man? Been a, been a good week, man. Yeah, you know, we have to pay the bills. You know what I'm saying? Right. You know, you know, I'm sorry we, we don't do it weekly, every two weeks. You know, we brothers got things to do. You right. know what I'm saying? So, had to pay the bills. I got the family to take care of, you know. This man over here was in <laughs> Vegas, man. you know, to see, you know what they call it, uh, Sin City, is that yeah, what they call City it? Yeah, Sin, whatever it's called. Yeah, yeah, you know, he out there for CinemaCon. Yeah. What was that like? Man, that was uh, that was a dream come true. That was really, it was, uh, it's like Comic-Con meets like, just, but just for film, mm -hmm. not just all the comic books and stuff, mm -hmm. which is just dope, man. It was, it was mostly for theater owners and exhibitors, so... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, for me, it wasn't as much, you know, when they had the booths about like the technology of projectors, I couldn't really get as much into that. Right. right even right. though it's stuff I do nerd out about a little bit. Right. But that was just the clips of the movies that we got to see. Uh, just everything there, man. Just, you know, keeping keeping film alive, keeping film exhibition alive. Nice, nice. Yeah. And, you know, usually we start with what, what you're watching. Again, this man's at CinemaCon. Yeah. He got the heads up on the flash. Like, oh yeah. Oh, give, yeah, yeah. give us a little Oh, and not not only that, but then he goes to he comes back home and goes to a premiere. Oh man. For Guardians yeah. of the Galaxy. Yeah. Yo, give us give us let us know what, what that was like. Yo, both both films. But all right, so both films, I mean, for 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 Flash we're not really allowed to like say say too right. much about Understood. it. Understood. Uh yeah, so but I know if you look at my Twitter, I'll tell you what I tweeted is that I I really enjoyed it. There you go. It was a moving uh, Barry Allen story, but also a great Batman story as well. I'm looking so forward you get, to that part. Yeah, yeah, I'm a, you I'm get a, a lot of Batman. Batman guy. Yeah, a lot of Batman. It's a good amount of Batman. It's All probably right. it's, All it's, right. it's it's uh it's still very much about Flash and about uh -huh. that character, uh, -huh. uh, and not as much Supergirl probably as you would think too. Uh, mm -hmm. but it's it is like very it was it was really good. Also, I gotta say too, they they made it very clear like this was an unfinished version, okay. so some of the CGI wasn't like fully finished and fully like thought out all the way too. Okay, and. Honestly, they 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 didn't show us any post credit scenes, so uh, I don't know what they're gonna cut or what they're gonna keep. You know, like it seems like they in a very much of a mist of like uh, we about to change the DCU, so who's about right. to be Batman going forward? I don't know, okay. but it was just dope. But the the film that they gave us for that was dope. For, I, for I heard it's dope. it's so according to the production designer, it's so good you're gonna forget about what Ezra Miller did. <laughs> that listen, I don't know if it's that good. But. Th that's 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 what they say. That's what the people are saying, <laughs> you know. Whatever, but uh, oh man, uh, I'm you know Jonathan Majors people is on the phone. Like, you mean the next Flash oh. movie? Right? <laughs> Word, but uh, and then and then Guardians of the Galaxy, which I ended up seeing when it came out. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I, I I like it was cool. Yeah, you, yeah, I, I I really loved it, man. Yeah, mm. it was dope. Um, for me, I actually ended up seeing it like three times. Yeah, I saw it oh, the, the early time, and I saw it just twice. In the cinema, um, I actually saw an IMAX 3D, which is some of the best 3D experience I've ever had in my life. Like period. Avatar level? Yeah, it was like Avatar level. Ooh. Like it was really, really good in that IMAX 3D. Like it was really, it was really sharp. Um, overall, man, I, I love the, I love that movie. Um, I thought to me, it, it was one of the best superhero movies I've seen in, in a while for okay. me. Uh, just because I, I know a lot of people don't love the animal torture aspect of it or the yeah. animal, you know, cruelty. Yeah. Um, to me, it felt, like, and I like jokingly compared it to this, but it's kind of like real. It's like the 12 years of slave for like animal torture mm. in the sense of like, it's like super, super brutal to watch and you kind of don't want to like look at it. But then once it gets to the end, it's like, oh, dang, like it's, uh, it's a film. Now, there ain't no Brad Pitt saving the day at the, at the end of this movie. Right, right. Um, but it's just, it, it does it does a really good job of taking the trauma and then making it into something like heartwarming. Well, it, Peter so. came out and was like kind of co-signed the film, if I'm not mistaken. It yeah. was kind of like, yo, this was like, this is dope. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's good, you know? Yeah, it, I think for, for me it's like, I we really don't see a lot of Marvel movies that are specifically about um, anything, you know, mm -hmm. like Ant Man is just kind of like Ant Man. Yeah. Obviously, Black Panther is very specifically about race, but I, which is something that we about to get into this episode. Exactly, exactly. Um, I just like that this film was very specifically about animals, even the Guardians, even you know the last song that they play at the end, Dog mm -hmm. Days. You know, what mm -hmm. I mean, I'm like, yo, this is nice. It just mm -hmm. they had a, a real good theme, and I like that. 
it felt like James Gunn is a real writer director being mm-hmm. allowed to make these movies. So hopefully the DCEU stuff don't suck. You know what I mean? I, <laughs> I trust him. I, I mean, yo, he salvaged Suicide Squad. Like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So he has my trust going forward. You know, so I'm looking forward to anything he's doing. I love Marvel, but, you know, Batman's my guy. So DC, I, I, I am rooting for them to do something. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um also, what's going on right now, the writer's strike is going on. Man, yeah, yeah, yeah. Big writer's strike. Shout out to all the writers out there, man. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I already know. Y'all are very low on the totem pole. Y'all get disrespected. Yeah. You know oh, what yeah. I'm saying? So Underpaid, I, over, overworked. O- overworked, underpaid, all of that. So I'm I'm with you in this fight. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It's going to affect a lot of things. I see Blade uh, just shut down pre-production again. Yeah. Well, that's been going through hell Yeah. For a long time. You know, so um, a lot of movies and shows is going to be affected by this, but that's okay. Right. People need to get paid, yes. first and foremost. Yes. All right? Like, this is hard. Filmmaking is hard motherfucking work. All right? That part. So... Everybody involved, they bust their ass. To, even with the that's this, you know, this is why I hate bad movies even more because it's hard to make a bad movie. <laughs> so the fact that you just went out your way to make this bullshit, <laughs> but whatever. We gonna stay positive. I, I'm trying to stay positive on this show. <laughs> but um, I'm 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 supporting the writers out there. I know I know you know RB. We 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 support y'all. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying. Also, I want to give a shout out to two of our black all stars, our real ones. Teresa Randall and Jamie Foxx. Mm. Let's start with Teresa Randall. Teresa Randall was just let go, of, not let go, but replaced on Bad Boys 4. And somebody put out a video of her in the streets in a walker looking a little disheveled. And the blog sites picked it up and said, she's a crackhead. Oh, no. She's going through this. She's got, she got this going on. People are throwing jokes all that on social media. You know how our people be sometimes, RB. I did some digging. Shout out to the sisters that that run Lipstick Alley because you know them they they get a lot of blocks. They're the real get, journalists. Yes, they are. So apparently Teresa Randall, Teresa Randall, if you don't know, she was a girl. She she played the lead in Girl Six. She played Martin Lawrence's wife in all the bad boys films. She's pretty much notable for that, but she had a moment where she was in Space Jam, uh, Spawn, you know, she was in Joyce. She's in King of New York, one of my favorite films. Mm-hmm. And um, she apparently broke her femur and she's doing outreach work in Skid Row in LA. So that's why she was out on the streets in the walker and she was just dressed down. So she is not no crackhead. Please don't disrespect the sister like that. You know what I'm saying? I'm tired of us talking about our, you know, our recording in progress or, or, or waiting to talk about our legends when they down and out. Mm-hmm. Look at what happened with Chadwick. Mm-hmm. Everybody had jokes for Chadwick mm-hmm. until he passed, mm-hmm. you know? So we got to learn from things like this. Stop, stop. Don't, let's not kick each other down. Let's not shit on each other. Mm. Let's you know get the facts straight before you get out there. YouTube blogs, like don't don't be nasty like that. And also Jamie Foxx, who you know uh, it's it's being reported that he had a stroke, right? And he was he was down for a while, like right. almost a good month or or a month. And uh, it got so bad to the point where some of his friends was kind of saying, "Pray for Jamie. A miracle. He needs a miracle." Blah blah blah. Apparently, it seems like he's back. You know, he's up and alert. He tweeted. Yeah. Hope, yeah so. You know, hopefully this him. You know what I'm saying? Right. I just want to give give love, you know, shout out to Jamie and all of that. But, you know, moving forward, today's episode is a very special episode. It is about Afrofuturism. Zoom, 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 zoom. You know, anytime I think about space, <laughs> anytime I think about sci-fi and space, I got to throw the echo on there. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> But um, we're going to talk on Afrofuturism in film in particular. And, to, you know, to start off, Afrofuturism was a, co- a term coined in the 90s by author and lecturer Mark Derry in his essay, Black to the Future. Afrofuturism is a cultural, artistic, and literary movement that explores the intersection of African and African diaspora culture with science fiction, fantasy, and speculative fiction. So, you know, you see Afrofuturism in, in literature with Octavia Butler. Mm-hmm. You know, music, George Clinton, yeah, Janelle Monet, most recent example. Yeah, you know, Outcast. Outcast. Yeah. You know what a I'm saying? A lot of those Missy Elliott videos. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Definitely. So and then we and then we're talking about it its appearance in films. So we picked out we handpicked certain films and then we're gonna we're gonna cover some other films, but we handpicked certain ones that RB and I were gonna run back and watch. One of the films that we decided to highlight is 2019's See You Yesterday. See You Yesterday premiered on Netflix, executive produced by Spike Lee, and directed by Stefan Bristol. And what do you know? Mm. We got my man, 150 grand, director Stefan Bristol on the show. Stefan, where you at? 
What up, what up, what up, what up, what up? My man, Stefan Brooklyn What's on up, Stephon Bristol. What's going on? What, listen, RB, me and this brother go way back. You know, we I, I watched this man way back. Way back. <laughs> I watched this man in the in the office running around doing what he gotta do and then seeing him make his film, man, he's an inspiration. I'm glad to have him as a friend. Uh Stefan, yo. But which the, office? Which office? Which office though? You know, you know what office, man. You know, you know, we, we put in work, you know, out in Brooklyn, you know, <laughs> you, you, you know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? But Stefan, I'm gl- we, you know, glad to have you on the show. RB and I are glad to have you on the show. Um, see you yesterday, man. I remember you, 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 you gave me an invite to an early screening, and I saw it, and I loved it immediately. And I was, you know, I was kind of singing his praises until it came on Netflix, and it definitely made a splash. People were talking about it all over Netflix, um, all over social media. Excuse me. I just need to ask you real quick: How did you develop the film? How did it come about? And then how did you get Spike involved? Uh. I- Man, that's it's. It took me like five years to make the film, five years, and it took me a while to write it as well. I was uh, I was a student at NYU Graduate Film School, um, and I was approaching my thesis years, uh, you know, because we got to shoot a, a thesis film to graduate from NYU um, to earn an MFA. And to earn an MFA, you got to shoot a, you know, you got to shoot a film. You got to shoot either a short film or a feature film at that time. And I thought I was able to do a feature film. So summer, summer of 2013, 2014, um, I was writing a movie, um, you know, about these two kids, Tom traveling, um, and, you know, I took my inspiration from Back to the Future and, of course, of course, I was dealing with something at home, um, something very important that's happening in, in my home, and I was taking that personal experience with these two young kids trying to learn how to time travel, and I and I applied that to my script, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a it was a feature film, and I wrote two drafts of it, and I gave it to one of my professors. She's and she, you know, she and and remember, it was the summer of twenty fourteen. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that summer, what happened? Um, Trayvon Eric Garner. Martin. Right. Oh, Eric Garner. Right. And Trayvon okay. Martin. Mm-hmm. Right. So that those kind of events bled into my script. Mm. There, was a, there was a scene about police brutality bled into my script. But the story was completely different. The story was something else. Mm-hmm. But there was a scene about police brutality and these kids trying to save somebody from being killed by a cop. One of my professors saw that script and she was like, yo, the script is great, but you haven't seen police fatality in it, and it's distracting. It's either you take that scene out or make that be the movie. And I was like, "Oh, that, that's actually pretty cool." So mm-hmm. I decided to make that that the movie, mm-hmm. and I brought it to all my professors at NYU, and and I want to make that my first feature film and my thesis film. So I brought the script. This is my second draft of the feature script. I brought the script to them and. And, you know, I said it was March of that year, right? Mm-hmm. And I wanted to shoot in June, <laughs> a feature film. They all looked at me, it was crazy. Mm-hmm. They say, no, dude, <laughs> you're not going to shoot a feature film within a couple of months. Mm-hmm. But the problem was, is that, you know, you haven't showed real strong work yet for you to do a feature film. So, you know, all my professors plus Spike said you should make a short film as a proof of concept for that feature where you go out. Wow. So that's why I did. I did a short film for my thesis. And now how I know Spike, to answer your question, I knew Spike for many years. I was a student undergrad at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. And I met Spike there before I got to NYU. I met Spike at my first college, my undergrad, um, Morehouse College. And I chased after that man for three semesters to get an internship at 40 Acres. <laughs> hey, do what you got to do, man. I was like, yo, Spike, it's my third time asking for an internship. Hook a brother up. I ran up to him one time. No, like, literally, that's how you ran up to him? It's all right, man. Just... <laughs> that, that, you, you well, didn't... it was after a meeting. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. It was after a meeting. It was after, it was after, not like that. It was after a meeting. So it was like, 
I ran up to him one time during a uh, few semesters prior, went, ran up to him in one uh, at a screening. I asked him there. Give you know, I, he gave me his email and I sent him my resume. No response. The next semester, he was at another screening, and he told me the same thing. Give me an email. Mm-hmm. Send me your resume. Mm-hmm. I did. Ain't heard shit. Mm-hmm. Third time's the charm. I had a meeting with the dean with other Morehouse students. You know, needing help to start a film program at at, at Morehouse because they had no film or arts program there because um, they were just afraid of it. You know, everybody was afraid of Morehouse to turn it into more of a business school than a liberal arts college, right? Mm-hmm. So we was there with the Dean, Dean Mills, and who was leading the charge was uh, Stephen Love. We called him Dr. Love. Stephen Love is a great, great uh, producer right now in Hollywood. You know, he's, he's, he produced their clone Tyrone that's going to come out and, and other amazing projects. And he was there leading the charge. Spike was in that meeting. We had a great meeting. I chased his ass after that. So Spike, the third time asking for an internship, hook a brother up. He said, third time, huh? I said, yes, sir, third time. All right, here's my, here's my email. Send me, send me your resume. I'm like, what the fuck? This is the same shit happening again. <laughs> but a week later, but a week later, I was, I was blessed to, you know, uh, I, was, I got from his, heard from his office that I got an internship for that summer. Beautiful. And from that summer, from that summer on, I was just, you know, up Spike's ass. Just like working for him, intern for him, and and being his PA, office PA. And then mm-hmm. that's where I um, met you. And then I was, yeah, that's where you met me at, at Forty Acres mm-hmm. in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. And and I was and I just bust my ass right in front of him. I was always there, you know. Even when I got to NYU, I asked him to be my mentor at NYU. When I got to NYU, I said, Spike, I want you to be my mentor. He said, yeah, no problem. And I always go to his classes. I always go to his advisement um, sessions. And, you know, and he really gave me the real deal. Every time I show him my film, he, you know, he ripped it apart. All my mm. films. I show him all my films at NYU. He ripped every one of, one of them apart. Mm. And the only time that man was ever impressed was when I made my thesis film. Mm. It's the only time. Nice, nice, and uh, and and I guess that's when he's just like you know when it was time for you to to, to boss up and turn it to a feature. He's like, "Yo, I'm gonna help you out." I'm guessing that's how that happened. Yeah, I was it was I was surprised. So we shot the feature film. You know, it went to a lot of plight to get that get that done. Shot not not sorry, it's my short film. Excuse me. So the short film, not the feature film, the short film. I shot my thesis film, which is a short film. It's also called See You Yesterday. It was a short version of it. Uh, Spike helped me out. He gave me a grant at NYU during that time. Um, and, you know, it was about to play at the film festivals, and he really loved it. Mm-hmm. And out of the blue, out of the blue, I was mean, I was starting to write the first draft of the feature film again. And out of the blue, Spike hit me up and said, yo, I want to be your producer for your first feature film. Hmm. Wow. I was like, wow. That's a dream. Out of freaking dream he said i don't want to step in anybody's toes let me know what was that ain't no motherfucking let me know let me know let's do it <laughs> he's trying to be, he trying to be <laughs> humble he's yeah. he, he trying to be on the humble you know damn well that's the <laughs> ultimate cosign you get right. spike lee come on now come on but nah, um it's it it was definitely a dream i was pinching myself i didn't the only all the, on the only time i ever asked him is for you know is, let me work under you as, a, as an intern or a pa and let me get your advice on how to make it a business and please read my scripts and please watch my movies, right? Well, and I was I was really surprised. You, really, really surprised. I was not expecting that. You did everything you were supposed to do. You know, you know I mean people when they get close to him, they want to know how you get put on. How you know they think that there's a guideline. That that might not work for everybody, you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? But it worked for you. And 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 you know, the spirit guided you. You you was being persistent, you know what I'm saying? Some mm-hmm. people just take the L be like, oh, he ignored me. Never mind. Yeah. I ain't gonna do it. Mm-hmm. You know, but you you knew yeah. you knew the, the what was about to happen. So you had to do that. You know what I'm saying? Right. Uh RB, you had any questions? Yeah, but nah, yeah. A, I mean, I was gonna ask. But here's the thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, nah, I mean that would I mean just you Sorry, know just, I, 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 Sorry, my bad. No, go ahead. Go Can ahead. I just say one more thing? Hold on. Hold on. Please, Sorry, yeah. my bad. I just want to say one thing because I know I want people to misconstrue something. Yeah. The like, the real work started when he said, "I want you to be a producer." Mm. I was terrified. Mm. 
I, you know, you think, oh, I put in the work then. Uh, uh-uh. the real work really started when it said, I'm your producer. Now, now I have to, now I felt like it felt like I had to prove myself to that point. But after when he said, I want to be a producer, let's work together. Now I feel like I really had to prove <laughs> myself now. It's yeah. like, oh shit. Ain't no half stepping. I cannot fail him. Now. Mm-hmm. Ain't no half stepping. Mm-hmm. So, in, you know, I poured in everything in my life into the film when he came on as a producer. Don't, not, not to say that I didn't before. Mm-hmm. It's just that the pressure is really on now. Right. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to mis- misconstrue that. I want people to understand, like, I, you know, the, the, the work didn't stop when I got, you know, the approval and, 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 the, and, the par- and, and that kind of partnership. I got to one success and that success is a continued journey. It's another journey. Mm-hmm. And, and, that, and that- I was terrified. You know, but I think I think Terrible. you ex- you you executed it well, man. And I I was gonna ask, like, you know, especially I'm a filmmaker myself. You know, trying to be in uh, in the filmmaking world, and obviously every all young black men, all the young black filmmakers look up to Spike Lee as a filmmaker. But actually having him on your team, so how you know I know you were talking about having that pressure. How did you uh, use that to better your film? Like, in what ways was Spike you know pretty hands on? In what ways did you improve? like your writing process or your drafting process after Spike came on board? Uh, Spike was very hands-on during the development process um, and, and, uh, and a little bit in, in the prep. Um, when you, when Frederica and I started writing the script, you know, we, we definitely implemented a lot of Spike's notes, but Spike's notes wasn't really that. Thankfully, we wasn't that much. Mm. You know, he allowed us, he allowed me and Frederica to do our thing. So Frederica Bailey is my co-writer. Mm. Excuse me, but, you know, I want to mention that. And, you know, um, I learned one of my weaknesses is like, I need to write with a co-writer. So Frederica Bailey, I got her to write the short film, my thesis film, and asked her to continue this journey with me to do the, the feature. Um, so her and I will work endless, endless hours, endless nights, you know, basically, you know, for free, to get the script right. And then when Spike, you know, took the script and read it, at one point he felt the the script was ready to go out into Hollywood. Um, so he would, you know, fly me out to LA, had meetings, had pitch meetings and, and whatnot. Um, and, you know, we got a couple of no's and I was like, after you got those couple of no's, you have to go back to that script and say, okay, what is wrong? Took their, their notes. Spike was already wanting to go back out with this and yo, fuck them, this, that, and the third. They don't know what they're talking about. And for Jake and I say, whoa, 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 Spike, we appreciate the enthusiasm mm-hmm. and your want to make sure we get it, but let us let us crack what is wrong with the script first before we go out. He said, okay, cool, do, y'all do your thing. Mm. And he gave us a space to, uh, for Jake and I to fix, you know, some of the, some of the, the reasons why we got those no's. And once we felt confident, you know, like every time he gave him the draft, he was ready to go out. We we had to like temper his excitement just a little bit. Like, hold on, hold on. I, I, we, we know you know what you're doing, but allow us allow us to um to continue to work hard on it um until we don't know what to do anymore. And you know, we exhausted everything with the draft and then we felt, you know, then we felt ready to send it out. And that's a that's the best producer to ever have. It's this is it's a producer who's just really to fight fight for you mm-hmm. whenever you know he's ready to fight for you he's ready to go back with you he's he, he believed in for jig and i so much um and i think that was that was beautiful and you know this, this the writing aspect it, it took um trial and error to get it right you know because you know on on the subject of after futurism mm. there's never been really a time travel movie about the black experience mm-hmm. you know so we really had to figure it out you know, we couldn't go. We didn't want to go further than the seventies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go you, further you, back than the seventies. We don't want to go no further back than that. You know what I'm saying? Never... That, that's what I was gonna say because <laughs> the, the, you know that there ain't nothing for us, and that's what that, that's what Octavia Butler's Kindred, you know, yes. is all about. There's other there's other you know sci-fi novels that mm-hmm. kind of play with those, but it's always to the past, and it's always going back to like slavery times. Mm-hmm. But this, I found, what I found most interesting about this film is that you're going back to a modern time. It's 
really just a couple of days, mm-hmm. um, which is, you know, yes. um, and is dealing with such, like you mentioned, such a contemporary issue like police brutality. Tell us about how, you know, especially in 2019, this is right before 2020, you know, where we had the big Black Lives Matter yeah. protests mm-hmm. really pop off. Um, but it's, yeah. it's a continued story that we see all throughout history. But tell us, tell us about um, addressing that head on in the era that we're in and how did your film play on even during the pandemic and during the Black Lives Matter movement as well? Um, we, we had to be very careful, you know, about how we address the issue in, in the film. We, like I said, it was trial and error. Mm. There is some humor in the, um, the writing, right? There was humor, you know, and we, we, I mean, we tested out the script out with a lot of people and it let us know like some areas that felt it took a lot of the situation more than it actually helped. And we had to figure out what we was really trying to say and what not. Um, so it, it, we, we went through that script with a fine, you know, very, very finite. We, we was not messing around. Um, you know, we had a lot of fun with the time chopper aspect, aspects of it, but not the police brutality as, aspect of it. Anytime we do a scene where the cops show up and his guns drawn, there is no comedy. Mm-hmm. It's real. Mm-hmm. Anything outside that scene, we can do whatever the hell we want. They were like in the mood. But during that scene, you know, it's very, very specific. A lot of, what's funny, like when people watch the film, um, they felt that they saw the murder more than once, mm-hmm. like more than three times. And in reality, if you actually watch the film, you don't see it. Mm-hmm. We, we, it's implied and hinted at it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how serious, like, it, it, people say, we see it so much in, in the film. It's like, you really have it. You, we, you make you feel it like you had, mm-hmm. which, which is sad in its own way. And, you know, and I had a lot of people challenge me on this stuff on do we need to see, you know, you know, a black body getting murdered over and over again. Mm-hmm. And since I stripped it down to only the last scene, of the last time we see it in the film, you know, even, it's still, it was very hard for the audience. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it was during a time as well where, and rightfully so, that uh, a, lot of, a lot of our audience, the black audience specifically, uh, was tired of seeing our tragedy, mm-hmm. our tragedies, um, being the forefront of, you know, um, of filmmaking. Like, you know, that's why we're so tired of seeing slave movies. That's why we're so tired of seeing civil rights movies. Not to say they should not be made. I think a certain a certain amount of people in our audience seen that so many times and experienced that in real life. We're just so tired of it. Um, you know, so even though people have championed the film um, for the uniqueness of it, you know, black kids and time travel and trying to save one's brother from wrong to kill, you know, uh, and unfortunately, you know, that's not the first time that the audience see such a tragedy. So when I started writing it, it was, it was like, you know, for me at that time it was a unique concept, but by the time it's released, there has already been films and other media and whatnot addressing police brutality, mm-hmm. but I still have something to say. Yes. from myself at mm-hmm. least I, st- I still have something to say mm-hmm. um but it's it was already saturated and that's something i couldn't help i couldn't you know nobody could help that uh in a way with that you know the police brutality topic is still happening uh that was released in 2019 and that was the conversation it was having on on the internet besides the whole everybody hate the ending you know uh yeah, type he, of you, conversation you're actually, you're actually touching on a question yeah. i had later on you know what i'm saying i was actually going to ask you about that yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I, I remember when it came yeah, out I, i'll get i remember hitting you and i yeah, was just I'll like get to that. i was like yo people was like yo it, it, you know what's funny i hate when people do this if they don't like the ending of a film the whole film is trash. Right. right. Oh, that movie was fucking trash. Mm-hmm. Why? <laughs> the, the ending. It's like, bruh, so you enjoyed it all throughout. If, all right, the ending it was a little trivial for you. You can't hate the whole film because of that. You know, mm-hmm. that not everybody said that. It was, you know, certain people. And I told you about it, Stefan. I remember when I saw it on Twitter, I was like, yo, like, you know, and I know you was answering some people and I told you, hey, don't even answer some. So, mm-hmm. yeah, touch on that. <laughs> Look, I, oh, I, me, Frederick and I always champion that ending. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people call it lazy and shit. I'm like, 
fuck you. You don't know the amount of conversations, the amount of writing you have to do for that ending to figure that out. And I've, and I've said this uh, on another interview, I think it was through Huff, Huffman, Huff Post, um, or The Root, I was, it was that Root interview. And that's the best ending we can come up with because there's two things. Number one, if we had to show her winning the day, mm-hmm. it will only be a conundrum of like, okay, you know, all's well, ends well. Mm-hmm. And I didn't, and I, I was like, I'm not going to oversimplify that. All's well, ends well, honey, you know, how's the salmon doing? How's the chicken doing? Let's get to eat. I didn't want to leave like that's such satisfying kind of ending. And if I were to show an ending where the brother gets killed or her best friend gets, somebody gets murdered because the rules we establish that if you save someone's life, someone else gets replaced. Mm-hmm. And if I were to, since we're going to stick with that rule and I was to show an ending of somebody else get killed by the hands of police, I'm going to tell the black audience that there's no hope. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want that either. So we chose an ending where we left it open-ended for the audience to make their own interpretation and figure out what they can do about um, about this tragedy, about you know um, this epidemic we still have in the country. I'm not gonna give you the fucking answer. Nah, I I, I love that though. And I- it will be um, it it will it will be it will be um irresponsible of me to give you an answer and and i think i think that's oh, sorry my bad no go ahead go ahead bro no i was gonna say you no, know I'm good. yeah yeah no i think uh i think that's you know as a filmmaker you know as filmmakers we always want to ask the audience uh, you know a question and have them think leave like a lingering effect on them especially by the end of the film ask a couple questions and things of that nature um are there any other like what you know obviously we saw, uh, you know, obviously we saw everything happen with Calvin and with uh, the friend and all, and and and, uh, and how, you know, changing the past is uh, going to end up affecting, you know, just the chain reaction. Were there any, you know, obviously you're, you're mentioning how in your film you established the rule of like, you know, one person goes, it's going to be replaced by somebody else. Um, were there any kind of other, you know, you mentioned back to the future, were there other like time travel films or stories or anything like that, that kind of inspired your time travel rules or logic or anything of that nature? We read a book, uh, how to create your time machine. And we was, you know, for and I was trying to test different ways of how to handle the time travel, you know, um, and once again, I'm not no expert. We were just trying to figure it out. You know, we, there was a string theory. There's the wormhole theory. Um, I forgot there was a third theory that we thought about. And, and essentially we, we decided to go through the wormhole theory which is the standard, you know, uh, time travel movie type of deal. Like that's what, mm-hmm. that's the same theory that he was in Back to the Future. Um, but, you know, so we, we, we did a little bit of research and then surprisingly we went, you know, um, I, I went to a physics professor at, at NYU to ask him to help me out. And he was like, you know, Time travel will never be real. It's, it's, it's impossible to right. be real. You can really just make it up. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's what we kind of, that's, that's what we kind of did. Yeah. You know, we kind of made think. Um. You know, it was it was it was difficult. It was hard. It was it was really hard. It was really much trial and error. It was there was no other real media mm-hmm. to talk about time travel. We, we 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 watched what's that what's that um, primer. We watched primer. Yeah. A um, that was a whole thing itself. You watch Twelve Monkeys. Mm-hmm. Primer was just, just confusing as shit. That's super, confusing, super. <laughs> but confusing. We, but the, the, a good inspiration from Primer, the good, yeah. But the good inspiration from Primer is the garage, the mm. bits and pieces that you just collect to create a time machine. So we we use that influence. Twelve Monkeys. We also use that influence in a way, um, just you know, you know, the nature of humor and comedy and how to dress, you know, the kids with the little goggles. I kind of use a little bit of that as well. Um, but, you know, but the vibe I love with See Yesterday is, is besides Tom Trump movies, is uh, Attack the Block. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
um, with the like love Attack of the, the Blind. That's one of my, that's one of my time, favorite joints, man. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, you know, you saw um, how how real the threat is. Like when the when they're you know when they finally reach back to the building, yet one of the uh, aliens you know bite into. Uh, one of those kids' legs and there's blood everywhere. Mm-hmm. As soon as you, as soon as you feel that it's real, and that's how I wanted that to be as well for our, for our film. It's, it's kid friendly, but yet there's some real shit, yep. you know. Um, and then you have the Goonies, mm. you know, just once again kids on the venture, the chemistry, but always a sense of danger. But chemistry is really, really important. And then uh, a Saturday morning cartoon I always loved growing up called Static Shock. Bro. Um, oh, come on. I want come on now. <laughs> come on. Talk that shit. Mm-hmm. So those so those are the influences. Also, oh, actually, one more. Uh, a lot of people don't know this. It's um, Run, Lola, Run. Bro. That was a huge influence. I love that movie. Man, I watched that in film school. Yeah, that's Great. amazing movie. Shout out to Casey Lemons who put that in my face when I was writing the script. So you'll watch this movie, Run, Lola, Run. And that's that was the big idea for three times throughout the, through my, my film. We, we time traveled back to the event three times, mm. and run a little run. She traveled back in her event three times, and each time is different. And that's the mm. same way I used for um, see yesterday three times to travel back to save a brother, and three times is different. Dope, great movie, run a little run. Yeah, that's a great film. Great and, you know, I was gonna, I was gonna ask your short film. Was it also three attempts in your short film too, or, or just? No, it was only two attempts. Oh, okay, it was okay. two attempts. Yeah, that's fine. You know, I think that's that's so yeah. um that's so that's so interesting because um you know the time the the traveling back is something that is a, a constant in um and Afrofuturism traveling back in time particularly. And when the traumatic mm-hmm. incident happens, mm-hmm. um, there's another film we're going to talk about a little later, Wrinkle in Time. Very different time travel film. Yeah. Or very different, I guess, travel film. Yeah. Um, but that this also triggered by like a traumatic um, event, uh, the same way that See You mm-hmm. Yesterday is. Um, but in terms of, you know, being in the Afrofuturism space and casting, you know, young faces, especially to be uh NCU yesterday. Um how was it how was it like working with those those uh those young actors and were they pretty on board with the science jargon? Was it kind of hard like, you know, not making sure that y'all, you know, especially with young actors like not getting them too lost in the sauce with like the dialogue and all the scientific stuff just kind of keeping them locked <laughs> in on the story. Those young actors was teaching me <laughs> about stuff, okay? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Edin, the lead actress, Edda Duncan Smith, she uh, she studies science uh. outside of acting. She's a scientist. She uh, she just graduated, um, you know, I uh, think in uh, computer science or something of that nature. Oh, wow. uh, she had a um, uh, what you call it, a uh, a work study or a, a program with NASA. She's her her skill set is science. So when oh, I was writing the script. And I finally gave it to her. She was correcting a lot of stuff on my script. Like, she would let me know stuff on this ain't it. <laughs> she would let me know and give me specific things, you know, about it, you know, especially about the um, the photons and the electrons and whatnot, you know, on how to, you know, how the the machine works. She was helping me establish that. And, and Dante, uh, he understood. He was just an emotionally intelligent guy. Um, who brought really strong um, um, ideas for his character as well. So, you know, both of them were just, they were teaching me. I knew them since they were 16. Oh, wow. um, and so they they kind of like grew up, I guess, with the characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the char- and then they're the characters for them are part of themselves as well. I, you know, I, they drew, you know, they drew a lot of ideas but the characters based on their own experience um, in life. Um, and and I'm grateful for them. I'm very, very grateful for them. You know, we both, all three of us, we challenge each other. All three of us. They challenge me. I challenge them. But mostly challenge me. Mm. And, you know, um, they're they're great. They were, they were absolutely great. It was, it was, 
<laughs> I was, you know, they check on me a lot. So <laughs> when it comes to the work, so I appreciate them. Dope, dope. So there was two Easter eggs that stood out for me in one particular scene. You already mentioned time travel and what you was inspired by. I seen the kindred. I seen there's a scene as a teacher reading kindred. Right. And then <laughs> now I went to an early screening. So I, I forgot what I had to do the day of, the, of your premiere, but I couldn't make the premiere. I went to the early screening. So when I watched it at home, I was surprised to see none other than Michael J. Fox mm. pop up in the film. Marty McFly. Mm -hmm. How the fuck did you make that happen? Wow. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, oh my God. I, uh, we, a couple, me and the producer trying to figure out how to get a cameo for that role. It's just, you know, it's, a, it's just a quick role. And, you know, I, you know, we, myself and the producers tried to write a letter uh actually it was who we had first we was talking about christopher lloyd first uh, and no actually let me let me go back let me go back let me go back we was trying to get neil degrasse tyson for, uh, for that role <laughs> <laughs> how can i forget so we was trying to get him he was contacting his representative and he was kind of getting back to us very very slowly, and they finally said he couldn't do it. And it was about weeks to shoot. And I was like, like who, who can we do it? Okay, let's get Christopher Lloyd. I said, I said, nah. It's, and one of my producers said, if you're going, you know, what about Michael J. Fox? If you're going to go, if you're going to go big. Right. I was like, shit, you think we can get him? Why not? Let's write a letter to him. So we all wrote a letter to him. Of course, we got Spike's blessing. And um, Mr. Fox read the letter. He said yes. Nice. To wow. my surprise, he said yes. Nice. Uh, that was during the summer, right? During the summer of 2018. But the day of when he's supposed to come to set, uh, unfortunately, he broke his arm. Mm. That morning, he broke his arm that morning. Um, and we had to quickly replace Mr. Fox with, with another actor. Uh, and I think that's what the version you saw on John is, is, mm. uh, is that other actor. So, but... Months go by, he finally healed. We did a reshoot and he came on set, you know, apologetic, really ready to go. Such an inspiration, such a great guy. And I was just like, yo, no crap, you've been doing us a favor. Let me go. Let's let's do this. So we should we should we shot the scene. It was in the middle of the scene, right? And by the by the time we had to set up the camera, um, you know, for another setup. I sat down with them and said, um, you know, Mr. Fox, you know, what do you, what do you think of the script? He said, I didn't read the script. Oh, wow. I, I decided to do this based off, your, based off the letter. Oh, wow. Wow. That's amazing. That's, that's love right wow. there. That's love. That is love. And here's, a, and here's the thing. I never told him. I never told him to, to say the, the famous line, Great Scott. Mm -hmm. I never said that. Mm -hmm. He did that himself. Mm -hmm. I was shooting his close up, and you know, at first he said, "Time travel, heavy." The whole damn crew went at. I was like, "Shut the fuck up! Quiet, quiet, <laughs> quiet! Let's go again, quiet!" Like you know. It's like, <laughs> I said, shut the fuck up. Why? So we went again. And then he went, time Great travel. Chris Scott. Mm. Dude, I, I lost my own shit. <laughs> oh, shit. I'm with you, man. I'm, I'm telling you, when I saw I him, that's that's, that's one of my favorite people, dog. So when I saw him, I was like, oh, shit. I think I, I want to say I text you. Like, yo, how the oh, hell? Man. I don't even think you ever really gave me an answer. But I was just like, yo, like, I didn't know. I didn't see this, you know what I'm saying? So that was dope. I like and that. that. And you know what's crazy too? Um, they and that's Michael B. Michael Michael B. Jordan. That's Michael J. Fox's last acting role, I think, ever. Right, if I'm not mistaken. Like I think he <laughs> retired after. Oh shoot. Yeah. Oh. I might be wrong, Stefan. You might be. You might know better I, than me. No, but. he was. No, no, no. He, you know, he did a a, a nice little cameo on um, Little Nas X video. Oh, um, man, you know, and that also takes place. It's a little Nas X music video, man. Yeah. No, no, it was like a movie, though. Yeah, the that's movie. big. That's that's man. You got the last one, man. You and got that's, that's been a big. You got him. You got <laughs> well, him. No, Stop I being humble. I hope. I, no, no, no. I hope 
No, or, no. Regardless, like I, I get what you guys are doing, but I just really hope that's not the last role. I oh really yeah, of course, no, of course, of course, yeah. of course. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Of I hope that I'm not the last. Like he, you know, um, he was even though unfortunately with, with the disease mm-hmm. that he has, mm-hmm. he still showed up professionally. Mm-hmm. He really held it together. You know, of course, you see him, you know, moving. Yeah. But when I before I call action, somehow he was able to maintain a solid, solid ground to give a great performance. And nice. it was good. that's just a true, true testament to who he was. He was just dedicated. He's still dedicated to his craft. Love it. You know, he's still dedicated to his craft and he's and he worked very hard just to, um, you know, just to make me happy, just to have, make the other, you know, his fellow cast members, you know, have a good time. Um, I was like, you know, every take was giving me choices. Which is, you know, which is something that yeah. you, you really appreciate from an actor, just to give you choices so for you. Um, because I don't really, the way I direct actors, I don't like to make up it. So, I'm, I, you know, I, I tell them what I need and, and I allow them to, you know, do what they need to do. And, and he was, um, I was, I'm forever grateful for, for that. You know, it's it, forever grateful. Yeah, well. We and he cared him. about the project. And he really cared about the project. But yeah, I mean, for him to come on without even reading the script and all of that stuff, that that's that's dope, man. That's dope, and we love the film. Yeah, you know, I, I you know we checked, I checked it out recently again just to refresh, and I'm just like, yeah, it still works. Like I still, I, I still like it the same way I saw it the first time, man. So, Stefan, thank you again for coming onto the show. This thank is thank you, this thank is you, a brother. blessing. We we appreciate you. You already know it's all love, bro. Me and you, we, you know, we go back, so it's all love. Um, can you? Tell the people where they can uh-huh. find you, and also let us know what you got coming up, man. Oh man, I got um, I got another movie coming up called Breathe. It's a apocalyptic film set in Brooklyn, mm. oh. starring Jennifer Hudson. Mm. Word. Jennifer Hudson, Mila Jovovich, okay, what? Sam Worthington, okay, oh, sure. Common. Oh, all right, and Quivenjane Wallace. There you go. Oscar nominee. There you go. Yeah. Oh man, he leveling up, y'all. My, my son is leveling up. He's leveling up. up. <laughs> hold, man, hold. We gotta give him one of them. Yeah, uh, give him the air horn yeah, yeah, man. Show that show God love, damn. man. He's, le- <laughs> he's leveling up out here. Let, let, let the people know where they could find you too. They could Google me. <laughs> All right, <laughs> you heard that? Google him. See that? No, you don't need my app. Just Google me. You need, you need to know what I'm doing. You need to know where I'm at. Google me. <laughs> Stefan, love you, bro. Thank you. Thank you so much for stopping by, man. We, we'll talk. We 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 like to have you on again right, eventually. You, he's a future real one, so we, we yeah. might we might dedicate that's a whole episode. Hey, yeah. yo, keep popping out them films, bro. Keep nah, popping out nah. them films. Thank you, brothers. Appreciate All right, it. All right. All right, one man. All right. Oh man, that was the fine Bristol people. Listen, we 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 leveling up too. You know what I'm saying? We got directors on the show. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So that was dope. Yeah. So we started off the Afrofuturism conversation with "See You Yesterday," and um, there, there's a whole lot of different examples of, of this. You know, it's going way back. Let's go way back to the '70s mm-hmm. with a you know a brother named Sun Ra. Right, a jazz musician, you know. Well, well, before actually, before we get into that, I, I did want to, I did want to shout out a couple, oh, yeah. uh, a couple other things oh, yeah, about yeah, yeah. just about just the, the term Afrofuturism. Oh, go, 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 go. I know you kind of mentioned Mark Marjuri was a uh, kind of the coin, kind of coined the term. Mm-hmm. Um, he's he, he's a white he's a white scholar, very nice, you know what I mean. But even you know, uh, he he was he was kind of looking at that term as more of like an expert. expert exploration mm-hmm. even his first definition he would kind of define this as like an explorative mm-hmm. uh, exploratory term mm-hmm. um it really got popularized by this young woman um named um alondra nelson um and the way it got popularized is through like this uh thing called a, a lift serve which was like one of them old things in the 90s which was like an email address that was basically a group chat mm-hmm. basically a group chat for email addresses and it was through talking to a lot of like college students that they define like what afrofuturism is and like a lot of the terms uh, around like Afrofuturism, mm-hmm. and there's actually a good film, a good documentary that's part. I know we're gonna talk more about like music and with Sun Ra, and in, mm-hmm. in particularly in a second. But there's actually a really good documentary called The Last Angels of History. Um, it's on YouTube. It's 45 minutes, and it's all about the history of Afrofuturism and music. So like George Clinton is in it. 
Um, and it, it it's kind of like an experimental thing, and it kind of uses this interesting framing device of like I don't want to spoil like how they how they do the documentary. Wait, where's this it. documentary? It's on, on YouTube. YouTube. It's on okay. YouTube. I'm put the link in the description. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, but that that you know she she helped probably and oddly enough um Alondra Nelson she's in the Biden administration now as like mm. one of the education people or something like that okay. um but just that's and 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 like you're mentioning with like even though the tw- the coin was kind of this, the term was kind of discussed in the late 90s um looking back in in time yeah there was a lot of early examples of afrofuturism mm-hmm. that existed everybody talks about Kendrick as being like a, a early like Afrofuturism. There's a novel from W. E. B. Du Bois. Du Bois. Yes. Yeah. It's called The Princess Still, and it literally has a uh, a giant uh, device in there called a mega megascope. Mm. That is like and this novel came out in 1909. So oh, this shit. was way before even the most popular time travel films. Mm. And I'm sorry, even the most popular time travel stories like the time machine mm-hmm. and all that this came before that and it had an early version of what we would con- con- consider a time travel device mm. with this device they were looking through past and present future all that kind of situation mm. so like you know afrofuturism is really just futurism really just sci-fi yeah. in a lot of different ways even yeah. though you know a lot of times sci-fi is and this a lot of times sci-fi was exclusionary towards people of color uh, yes. as, in terms of the othered aspect, the right of yeah. the being othered out of society. L- l- let's look at the Jetsons. Look at cartoons. Yes. Have you ever seen a Negro in the Jetsons? Nah. In space? <laughs> yeah. Everybody is white. The robot is white. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Everything across the board. So yeah, like this is this is us creating a space for ourselves in that conversation. And that's why, and that's why, you know, getting to um getting to exploring our own spaces, our own places. That's what the whole crux of uh, space, um, the the Sun Ra film is mm-hmm. about. Uh, space is the place. Space is the place. Sci-fi, you know, Tarzan. Well, that's not sci-fi, that's fantasy. But yeah. fantasy, sci-fi, it's all about the other. The thing from another planet, another mm-hmm. classic sci-fi film. That's a whole film about immigration. You know what I mean? That's a whole yeah. anti-immigration. Yes. And, you know, there's films that are, uh, you know, obviously there's some geniuses that got on it early and knew the right way to tell stories like George Romero with mm-hmm. Night of the Living Dead. That mm-hmm. was probably one of the more positive examples of black mm-hmm. representation mm-hmm. in sci-fi and horror. Mm-hmm. But there's there's not a lot. And that's why Afrofuturism had to become its own space to where now sci-fi is villainizing the other. The Afrofuturism is embracing the other. Right. And embracing being uh being outside of the mainstream. Right. So no, yeah, no, you nailed it. You nailed yeah. it. That that's so true. You know, and that, and like you said, that's what's this kind of discussed in space is, is space is the place. It's a very odd different film. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's, it's very, very odd. odd. Yes. But it's 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 I I I credit it for what it tried to do, what it's trying you know, what it's trying to do is it's really basically spreading a lot of Sun Ra. Sun Ra's this uh experimental jazz musician who had a lot of philosophies. He was really, I don't know what his name was before, but he adapted the name Sun Ra. And this is this whole film is his vibe. It's on HBO Max. It's very trippy. Check it out. This was all his vibe. And like, you know, it's, it's uh, he lands in Oakland. Like mm. it's, it's like a musician that was lost in space, landed in Oakland. He's trying to save black people and take them to space. Mm. So it's it's a it's a very trippy film. It's, right. it's all over the place, you know. Yes. Um, years later, there's a brother from another planet, directed by John Sayles, mm. who um, it stars Joe Morton. Joe Morton, y'all remember? Y'all might remember him if y'all watch a different world. He played Byron. You know, he was on Scandal. He played uh. Kerry Washington's dad. Mm. He was also in Terminator 2 as Miles Dyson. Right. He he created yeah. basically created Skynet and he's low key the reason why Judgment Day happened. You right. know what I'm saying? <laughs> and he's yeah, he's in this film where he just kind of pops up out of nowhere. It's this this extraterrestrial. It's like a black ET story almost. Mm. Like he just kind of pops up on the he washes up ashore in New York and he doesn't have any lines in the film, but like he's just it's almost like silent film. It's like he's communicating in his own ways, and you just seeing the people who interact with him. It's it's a dope film. It's a dope it's film. I watched it. I, I watched it one night, just random. Like it, it came on like Black Stars, like three in the morning. I was up one night, and I was like, "Yo, this is dope." And and it's also the first uh, on screen appearance of the Men in Black because there's two white men that's looking for him. That's, really? that's trying to get rid of him. Yeah, because he's all over Harlem and they like going to the bars and talking to people like, have you seen this guy? And da, 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 he's dangerous. What? You know, yeah. And, and and it has its themes. It has themes about, you know, prejudice, racism mm. and all that stuff. It's just him being different. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And that's the central theme about Afrofuturism that's mm-hmm. also all around. You know, time travel is a big theme uh, in Afrofuturism. It's also... Uh, 
like you mentioned, that isolation, that being um, being of of one's own, being of oneself, and especially how that connection makes makes black people as a whole like feel you know the African diaspora as a whole feel othered, feel um, not part of the general society, and feel you know kind of communally have to bond with each other. There's another weird sci-fi film that came out on uh, 1990s. It's called San Kofa. It's from Ethiopia. And actually, Ava DuVernay is the one who helped get it re-released. You could, you could catch it on Netflix. But it's essentially about a young African-American Black model who goes to um, Ethiopia or some one of the African countries to like do a photo shoot with like a white photographer. But it's almost like a similar story as Kendrick. Like she ends up going back in time mm. to like the West Indies on the plantation kind of situation. Oh wow! That film, yeah, it's uh, it's on Netflix. Very, I'm not gonna lie, it's a little harder to watch. Like, <laughs> <laughs> even like visually, it's not like the prettiest film. Yeah, but it is, uh, it is something. But you know, kind of going to that that uh, uh, brother from another planet, like that that whole idea of people, black people, and a a predominantly white space or predominantly not their own space, mm-hmm. how they adjust to that. That's also the some some um a lot of the symbolism that we see in Afrofuturism. So it's pretty dope. hmm And uh I, you know, I just want to shout out this one project um by Reginald Hudlin. He he had a short lived anthology series on um HBO called Cosmic Slop. It was uh mm. inspired by George Clinton. Really? As a matter of fact, George Clinton is almost like a Crip Keeper like presence in the show. Like sort of like oh. Crip, Crip Keeper in the sense of Tales from the Crypt, like right. he presents the stories. Mm-hmm. And there was this one story on there called Space Traders, I believe. Mm. It's based on a short story where it was like, uh, I think aliens was coming to Earth to provide peace and everything in, in exchange for black people, in exchange what? for like dark skinned black people. What? Yeah. So Man. it like It's like slave I, trade right there. Basically. What? Yeah. It was it was something like that. You know, if 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 you're familiar with it, please, you know. Tap into the comments. Let me know if I'm tripping, but I believe that's what it was. And I just remember the, the it was a haunting image at the end. It was uh, Robert Guillaume is in it. He he's he played Benson. He was also in Meteor Man, mm. and um, he was pretty much fighting against it. And it was like it was like the the deadline for that. Like I think Americans voted for it to happen. Like they what? went to the polls. Like yeah, get these mom, these black what? motherfuckers up out of here. And yeah, and like I remember there was just a, the end. Like he has a light skinned wife. She was trying to you know. You know, get a little brown face and go with the family, and uh, then the, the CIA, whoever came, separated and was like, "Nah, you like nah, like they like they wiped her face since she was light skinned. Nah, you stay," and grabbed them, and yeah, and they took them to the show. And you were just seeing black people going up in portals, just like by the droves. What? Like some black people was trying to fight back, and they got killed by the government. And oh, trippy, man, trippy. Wow. But I just, I always, I was always interested in how black stories could be told in sci-fi or, or, or horror. Which you know we're gonna tap into in a little bit, mm-hmm. um, you know sci-fi and horror, all that stuff. There's, there's so many ways to tell our stories. You know what I'm saying? And not mm-hmm. everything has to be the you know. And this is no slight to anybody, of course, but this not everything needs to be the hood or message film. You know what I'm right. saying? You could get it off in other ways. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, there's that, and then you know, you know, as a turn of the 21st century, we, you know, I don't, I didn't see, I don't know, I maybe I didn't see a whole lot of it. I, I didn't notice it, but. What really brought it back, put it back on the forefront was 2018's Black Panther. Yes. The film that that nobody thought would be as successful, one. Mm-hmm. And the film that debunked the long, the long, uh, the long pushed narrative that black films don't travel. Right. That movie became a fuck it the gangbusters at the box office. Yeah, over a billion. It's one of the it's, I believe it's still the highest grossing Marvel solo movie mm-hmm. to this day. I believe so. Yeah. I believe so. And besides, you know, obviously the Avengers and whatnot. But right. and it's also and you mentioned how it didn't, you know, how there's that narrative that didn't travel internationally. It made all over six hundred million dollars internationally, including a bunch of money in China, mm-hmm. which people think, ah, oh, black people don't, you know, you can't get black movies in China. Look at what, look at Black Panther. Also, Wakanda Forever was literally the first. Marvel had a whole ban, like trying to low key ban Marvel for a good amount of time from like twenty eighteen or twenty nineteen to like recently. Mm-hmm. But Wakanda Forever was literally their first movie back. Like China was like, we want. What kind of forever? Yeah. So like, no. we want you know they want them. They want you know you know it's, it's so interesting. I don't even think Marvel knew what they had because oh, nah. let me tell you something, people. I, I collect action figures. I'm not stupid. All right. Mm. Whenever the action, whenever a superhero film or something is about to come out, them action figures is on the market early because mm. you got to cash in. You know mm. why? When I went to go see Black Panther, 
I'm hype. I'm hype. Come out the movie. No action figures in the stores. What? Nowhere. Yeah, like they were just like they didn't have enough for sale. Like, they didn't have no during Black History Month. That yeah, we came out during Black History Month. Right. There was. I don't think they really saw it like. Oh, I don't think people's gonna fuck with this because you know. I, again, I collect action figures, so I know this. Mm. Black action figures and women action figures like are always shelf sitters. Mm. So I think mm. the people at Hasbro and them were just kind of like, eh, these Negroes ain't gonna buy no toys. Right. These little white kids don't want to identify with some African. Mm, mm. But then you know, months later, like, I think like before, like before the year ended, then they had like a last. Uh, there was like a wave that came out. And then then they started bringing things out later because I don't think they expected that to be as big as it was. You mm. know what I'm saying? That mm. movie just it it just kicked the door open for so much, especially in in the sense of Afrofuturism yes. and that sense of storytelling. You know what I'm saying? And it, and it it brought a different kind of uh, Afrofuturism than we we've, we've been used to a lot because, like I mentioned. A lot of Afrofuturism deals with trauma, deals with yeah. um, sadness, deals mm-hmm. with traveling back to slavery times, or, you know, or like we talked about Stefan, dealing with modern issues, mm-hmm. modern contemporary mm-hmm. um, issues. Uh, but with Black Panther, it really brought a positive spin to it, yeah. um, imagining a world of, you know, that we're fully not only um, accepted, but we're technologically advanced, we're yes. superior, yes. you know, um, which is definitely a dream that. A lot of us black people hope to have sometime in the future. And they wouldn't let nobody in that shit. Yeah, exactly. They was like, nah. Like, right. <laughs> I love... It. Well, if you read the comic book, you know, I, this is what tripped me out about T'Challa. Like, he's not, I want to say Republican, but he's... <laughs> he, conserved, he conserved it to his people. Yeah. He patriotic yo, yeah, to Wakanda. You yeah, know what no, I mean? Like, he's yeah. very, like, in the comic books, he was very, like... He's a, he's, a, he's the type of brother motherfuckers we, we get at nowadays on social media. Oh, you know what I'm sure. saying? Yeah. But no, I, 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 man, yo, that that was the dopest part about it. Like just seeing how they colonizer, like you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying, like mm-hmm. how they was getting that, giving up the energy. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And even, and even, you know, again, speaking of, of of T'Challa, like even like the people, how they almost didn't accept. Um, what was Michael B's character's name? It was Killmonger. Kill, Killmonger. Eric Killmonger. Eric right? Killmonger. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know him, and 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 even that whole thing, where it was like. You know, his strife with them. Yo, I came out the movie kind of like, yo, he kind of got a point. He right, yeah. <laughs> you know, he, he right. got a point. If, there, if there's one criticism I, I legitimately have about Black Panthers, that they should have, you know, <laughs> he was right. He, they shouldn't have killed him. Like, yeah. they, he should have been, he, if he asked me, he should have been taking over Wakanda and, yeah. like, Chadwick stepped yeah, back. Yeah, you know because, what you mean? know, his whole thing was like, yo, y'all got this stuff going on here, but people, my people back in America, we in the, we, you know, we in the slums, we, mm-hmm. we impoverished. I grew up in the hood. Right. You know what I'm saying? And that's the genius of Ryan Coogler right there, yo, because that, it could have easily, and from what I heard, you know, from what I heard of the original script, the original story outlines that they had before, Ryan Coogler got involved. We were like piss poor, pathetic. Like I heard mm. the white dude Everett Ross. He was like a much bigger part. He was like, oh, he's saving the day. I'm like, yo, nah. But Ryan Coogler, you know, he's the man. He brought Creed back and didn't make it corny. He yeah. brought Rocky back and didn't make it corny. Yeah. And he did this. He made it so much of a personal film with the Oakland connection, mm-hmm. with just the experiences of Black America in general. Like that's not a perspective that we didn't see. Not just talk not even talking about Marvel movies and blockbusters, period. Like, mm-hmm. we didn't have a lot of the discussions we were having about art appropriation, art being stolen, mm-hmm. a lot of the conversations about, um, our, like you said, colonialization. And mainstream cinema and blockbuster cinema, that mm-hmm. was not happening, period. At all. But it brought that conversation to the forefront and made it, um, and made that perspective legitimate. Again, the only thing that, like, kind of sucks is that you know they kill they kill they kill they kill Killmonger and they kind of make him seem like a ruthless evil guy. Yeah. When in reality, like he was right about ninety percent of the time. Yeah. The only the only times he was wrong was when he like shoved that old lady or or whatever or like or, or when he oh. like burned down the flowers. Yeah. yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But beyond that, like nah, they shouldn't be fighting. They should have. If the if the movie, I feel like if the movie would have not been Disney, if it would have been like something else. T'Challa and Killmonger probably would have held hands that not held hands but shook hands and like mm-hmm. gotten over the same way that Wakanda Forever kind of ends. I think that that the way Wakanda Forever kind of ends is the way the first Black Panther yeah. should have ended in my opinion. We're, we're, and it ended in a perfect thing where they still stand on what they stand on, but, right? But they're gonna come together and try to figure out how to you know mm. get to the next level with exactly, everything. exactly. But that's not that's to say you know I love Black Panther. I, that's the movie I've probably seen the most in theaters like i think i saw it like yeah, six of, times in theaters for me yeah, personally like yeah. just from me being like i saw it myself and i saw had to take my mom's to it had mm-hmm. to take some friends to it had mm-hmm. to take some other friends mm-hmm. to it you know mm-hmm. what i mean so there was that movement it was that moment and that movement that really propelled 
a lot. I feel like a lot of new um, Afrofuturism movies mm-hmm. that we see now, we've been seeing a lot lately. And then what the next one after that was uh, Ava Duvern- Duvernay tapped into that with A Wrinkle in Time, yeah. which actually. Um, <laughs> Actually, did come out a couple months before Black Panther. Oh, it did. Oh, and, but it low key. And I hate saying this, but like it didn't make money. It flopped. Yeah. And then a lot of people, I think that's why Disney was a little bit like hesitant on mm. pulling the trigger. I might be wrong. Actually, let me not say that. I might be wrong. I might be wrong. They might have coming out. I think they did come out the same year. Okay. I think they just might. It definitely flopped though. Yeah, it definitely that, did that flop. Yes, but I think now I'm thinking about. It, I think maybe Winkle and Time have came out like a, a month or so after. That, that, you know that, that was very close to each other. Very yeah, close. that whole time was a blur to me because it was. I, I had the movie pass. I was going to the movies a lot. That's that movie pass. That was, <laughs> see, that's why I went to see Black Panther that many times. I was like, yo, swipe that, swipe that. And speaking of so many times, man, I saw a Wrinkle in Time twice because yeah. you know, right? Listen, Ava DuVernay, you know, I appreciate you, sister, but you know that that you know, I really wanted to like it. Yeah, yeah, he wasn't the biggest fan. It, yeah, I wasn't the biggest fan of it. And I, from what I understand, the source material, which is the original book, novel 19, from 1962 or mm-hmm. something like that, I heard of that it's it's so vast mm-hmm. that it's really hard to make an adaptation of, mm-hmm. you know? Because mm-hmm. that's why I kind of got to feel that I wasn't getting everything or, or, or it was like a, a edited version of something. I just, I just felt very incomplete while watching it. Yeah, yeah. I think that, that movie... Um... Well, for one, I I I, I appreciate I, I like the movie mm-hmm. and I, I appreciate it because I never seen the source material, but from my understanding, source material is like mostly like white white kids, mm-hmm. white white people. Mm-hmm. Um, so it it is one of the few examples of a uh, uh, of sci fi that got re transformed and reimagined in an Afro futuristic lens. Mm-hmm. Um, so on that level, I appreciate it, of course. Um, and I also, uh, but I, I do, I do a hundred percent hear what you're saying. And I, you know, I think you're right. I think it's one of those like Lord of the Ring mm-hmm. situations where mm-hmm. maybe it could have been multiple movies or mm-hmm. if they had a, a sequel or something, they could have expanded that mythology a little bit more. That was my one criticism for me too. Like the, the time travel or the dimension traveling mm-hmm. that was going on really didn't make a lot of sense to me either. It did mm-hmm. feel a little bit random. Yes. Um, but then at the same time, I'm like, yo, I, I also don't want them to like over explain it either. Like, I don't right. want them to be like right. giving us a bunch of explanations about it. So um, I like that they focused more on the emotional aspect of it, the heart of their journey. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it is, it is, it is, it is, it isn't like, it wasn't, you know, it did pretty well critically, but it didn't do the best, uh, you know, fan score wise, uh, mm-hmm. audience score wise. Mm-hmm. And it also didn't do the best like box office wise, but I do appreciate a lot of what that movie. I I, like, I kind of forgot about it until we kind of mentioned it. You know, when we were talking earlier this week. I kind of forgot about that. I'm not going to hold you. You but know, I will say there are some visually beautiful parts. Oh in yes, there. like yes. I will say the first scene when Oprah first comes up and she's like the giant in the yes. backyard. Yeah. Like that was actually great. So, shout out L.A. It's a great L.A. movie too. Yeah. You know what I mean? A very specific to L.A. I thought the cinematography. Also, when they go into like that colorful. Um, Green planet that like Reese Witherspoon's like the kite looking mm-hmm, joint. Mm-hmm. I thought that was nice, um, but yeah, you know, it was it was okay. It was okay movie, but it I just appreciate the fact that it's like Afrofuturism and the fact that like it took some old sci fi and then remade it in in our image and, mm-hmm. and took you know a lot of our struggles, even though it's a little bit like biracial struggles too. You know, the white <laughs> yeah, dad. You yeah. know what I mean? So it's like it's not fully. You know, is it fully Afrofuturism? I don't know, but yeah, I, I, it's, I, it's I don't know if I can't remember if I if I knew the dad was white. When I was going into the film, I remember yeah. I was seeing, I was like, <laughs> "Come on, it's man. Chris Pratt, yeah, yeah, Chris Pine." I mean, Chris Pine. Chris Pine. I'm like, but 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 shout out to Ava DuVernay getting Oprah. Oprah, hey, Oprah, a whole billionaire. She don't need to be doing nobody's movies. She don't. She, she don't. But she popped out. You know yeah. what I'm saying? She popped out. Uh, Reese Reese Weatherspoon, um, mm-hmm. Mindy Kaling. You know, she's mm-hmm. all right. She, yeah, 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 yeah. I got my right. issues with her, but uh, yeah, that Scooby Doo joint was not. Oh, not it was the right. Velma joint, right? That was that was yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Just try it was a try hard situation. Yeah. I just don't I don't like when things are remade or re you know reimagined and it's just like there's no purpose. Right, right. What was the pur- I, and I'm not and I'm not mad at her making Velma, you know, South Asian. I'm not mad at that. Mm. That's white people problems. I don't have right. no problem with that. Right. I, I don't mind seeing people of any different color, you know, whatever. But mm-hmm. then it was just what did you want have to make it so raunchy for? Right. Why, what was the why? What right. was the point of all of this? Yeah, nah, I don't know. I didn't watch. It. I feel like that show like fell on deaf ears when it came out. Like nobody watched. I watched two episodes and I was like, yeah, this is not. Yeah, this ain't is not it. For me. Yeah, this ain't for me. You know what I'm saying? But um, but then you know, going forward, 
Mm-hmm. You know, you have Jordan Peele hits the scene with Get Out, right. Us, and then his next film, Nope, right, touches on, you know, sci-fi. Touches yes. on the, the, the we didn't, I didn't, I didn't know what Nope was about. You know, going into Nope, I had no idea what it was about. Mm-hmm. Like it was just like I was seeing little things, and and then you know, I go into the film, and I get what I get, and I'm just like, yo, this this was it was dope. Mm-hmm. It was dope. I have I have no I I know a lot of people didn't like it I don't know what I don't, what did you tell me what mm-hmm. did people expect from Nope I think it's so funny because I don't I I, I really don't know um, yeah. I think people I think when I talk to a lot of people and um, even fans who like really love Nope I think the one consistent thing is the climax I think they might have wanted a little mm-hmm. bit more out of the climax mm-hmm. even though I, I felt like it was personally pretty action heavy especially if you saw it in IMAX like yes. I saw it I saw it in IMAX and bro when that alien like fills up the frame yeah. it's like that felt epic that felt amazing to me but for I guess a lot of people they wanted more of a a duke it out battle, um, you know, kind of situation. But you got to remember, Jordan Peele, he he ends his movies early. Like, yeah. Get Out ends right when uh, the TSA agent pulls up mm-hmm. and then it's over. Mm-hmm. That, us just ends, like, literally the last act, fight scene happens and they're driving in the car and it's over. Mm-hmm. Like, that's just Jordan Peele's thing. Like, he's not going to give you an over explanation. You, you don't need to know who lived, who died. Right. You know, ain't got to be too much of a thing. Like, it's just, it just ended. Mm-hmm. So I appreciate that about, about if, if, if you didn't have those expectations. Um, it's so funny though, because even though Nope is not, it doesn't take place in the future. Um, so, you know, it's not necessarily like Afrofuturism, I guess it it does fit squarely in that category for two reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the one, the technology aspect is, uh, is a big part of what Afrofuturism is like the advancement of technology. Obviously that's what Black Panther is like super cool with the time travel. That's why everybody talks about time travel films. But this film, I think it talks about the, the technology of film mm-hmm. in a really interesting way. Mm-hmm. Like how, you know, they have the cinematographer who's like trying to shoot everything on IMAX cameras. You have the Brandon Prayer, the, the electric fry guy who's like trying to do everything digitally. Mm-hmm. Um, and it plays with how black people have used that technology and been a part of that history from the very beginning. Yep. Because also a theme in um, Afrofuturism is the ancestors, as tapping into your ancestry for a lot of films, right? With Kindred, with... Um, that one I mentioned, Sanfora, mm-hmm. um, is tapping into like the ancestry. And this film is all about black ancestry, right? Like how they're trying to preserve the legacy of their far, of their um of their ranch, of their horse ranch or their animal ranch, and how that legacy they're trying to preserve is Hollywood history. Mm-hmm. You know? Um, so it digs really into some really good themes. I just love it. I think there's so many like self-referential Hollywood movies that came out in 2022, but to me this was like easily the best one mm-hmm. because it did it in a way that wasn't like super over the top or wasn't you know showy or wasn't about like oh I'm a movie star like yeah. it was actually about real people in uh in these real situations and it was mm-hmm. dope man it was just dope yeah if you if you work in film especially that 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 I feel like that film was dropping just Easter egg throughout like if you work in production yeah. like it's just like oh yeah like that felt so natural mm-hmm. seeing the things that we've seen in the film and the way it was shot man I I think they were saying that they shot the night scenes during the day yeah that yo that I I saw the Chinese theater opening day mm. the, uh, Daniel Kalua yeah. is his name mm. It's a really dark brother. You know when when people are, are when dark skinned people are shot, you gotta you gotta you know it's very sensitive. You gotta mm-hmm. you gotta shoot them a certain way. It's something that you gotta understand. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it's like he could he, he they could easily did them night scenes. He could got lost in the darkness. Nah, you know, yeah, literally. You know what I'm saying? Right. But the way they it was shot and color graded and all of that, it was just like elite cinema. It was like yo, it was the attention to detail. All of that, and then and then you know you get the great performances from himself and Kiki Palmer. Jesus. I I love I always did like Kiki Palmer, but like this film, like my appreciation for her went up like mm-hmm. quadruple off of this film. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Just she was great in it. It was you know the, the whole the Jean Jacket, the the horror in that seeing that when when the ship pulled up to the uh to the amusement park and sucked up all them people. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yo. That film was so good, so and, so bro. Good. And just to and even, um, you know, we didn't even talk about Gordy, that that damn monkey. Oh, you right, know what I mean? right, like, right, <laughs> right, right. That Gordy, <laughs> yeah, that monkey shit. Because you know, that's I kind of had a feeling they were going to go down that route. Because remember when that when that happened in real life, when the mm-hmm. monkey like the, you know messed up the family. Mm-hmm. And I remember when the lady that was the the victim, she was on Oprah, 
And uh, I remember my, my mom was home from work that day, and I watched it. And I remember when I seen the trailer for Nope, I seen the girl with the you know the, the teeth exposed and like face all messed up. I was like, yo, that remind me. This is I, as I'm watching the Super Bowl trailer. I'm like, damn, that remind me of the shorty mm-hmm. I seen on Oprah. And then to see that story come together, I was like, oh, okay, okay, like you know, th- them kind of pulling from that situation. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yo, man, yeah, that, that dope, yo, I love Nope, man, I love it. Yeah, that was yeah. That John was, Pill's three for three. He's three for three, and it's it's funny because even though I even though you know his other films don't necessarily fit into Afrofuturism right. like Get Out or Us, um, there's a whole there's another avenue of of thinking that's called like black speculative fiction, mm. which is like kind of an encapsulation of all of it, like Afrofuturism, Afro surrealism that we see in like Atlanta. Um, obviously, like I mentioned to you before, my I don't know why I mentioned Ghost. Before to you before, but yeah, yeah. that's another one that's like Afro surrealism. Also, there's another thing that they got called ethno gothic, ethno gothic. So okay. it's basically like you know ethnic people being in the in the gothic horror world. That's like the new kind of sub genre, which okay. I think is uh, I mean, I think it kind of works because if you think of some like Get Out Us, even that new one they did on Wendy and Wendell or whatever that animated film. Oh yes, film Netflix. On Netflix, yeah. It's not necessarily that's that's Jordan Peele's involved. That's, that's with also that. Jordan Peele, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. I didn't even think about that. But that's also like you know, it's not necessarily sci-fi, but it's it's more in a horror film. But it's you don't see the positive representation of people in color mm. in a certain kind of way that I, I I think we're seeing a lot of now. So, um, but man, Dope is just to me that was my best. That was my favorite movie of last year. So yeah. he, you know, Jordan Peele. He to me he's three for three, and to me, Nope is honestly my probably my favorite of his films. Honestly, mm. I know it's unpopular opinion, but. Yeah, I, I'm I not. Like I'm not mad at it. I'm gonna go with Get Out for that Get one. Out, but yeah. I'm not mad at it. And you know, for another example of Afrofuturism in film, you know, the next one is this brother sitting right next to me right here. Oh, 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 wait, what? Yeah, 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 hold yeah, up, yeah, hold up. Tom, you know, this. You know, he did a short film that that garnered a lot of attention, yeah, awards. Man, it was doing you, the film festival circuit. Time stamp. Yeah. Please talk to us about time stamp. Oh man, thank you, man. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, man, it's a it's a nice little short. You know, we did it and. um it's funny, we uh, filmed it way back in like 2019. We filmed it way back in 2019 mm-hmm. um, and just spent like two, a whole like year and a half just like doing the post, like the VFX on it. Mm-hmm. It's because we had no money. And uh, shout out our guy, uh, Guy Bergman, um, who was our visual effects supervisor, um, who did all, all the effects on that. But yeah, man, it was just... Uh, yeah, so we, tell, tell the people what the movie's about. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a short film. It's, a, it's a, also about time travel. Mm-hmm. Uh, young woman, uh, Jackie Dixon. She loses her parents in a in a robbery, like act, you know, accident situation. So she travels back in time to, um, you know, to try and stop that from happening. Essentially, mm-hmm. um, you know, Ali, Ali, very kind of kind of similar setup, not setup, but like similar kind of situations that we might see in like other films. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we just saw like See You Yesterday, mm-hmm. so it's like um, that situation. But it, it, but you know, she's helped by this dude named. Um, Bill, who uh, is played by a friend of mine, Ken Knapsack, a mm-hmm. buddy of mine who I've known for a long time. Um, and he has like this garage and he's helping her like time travel essentially um, through that. So, yeah, it's a, it's a nice movie, man. Me and my boy, Cade Hughesby, who I went to college with, at USC, mm-hmm. we, uh, we co directed it, co wrote it together. It originally, definitely originally started as like a comedy. Um, oh. It was a like, straight up comedy. And Cade had, he had the idea, I guess he watched some. A couple YouTube videos about wormholes or something and wanted to write like a comedy about some people going in time. And my dark, depressed ass was just like, nah, let me <laughs> let me just make it like let me just do a rewrite on it. Cause we rewrote something and then we kind of gave up on it. Uh-huh. And then we just decided not, you know, we just decided to rewrite it. Um, and then we well, we and then we ended up liking our new version of the script so much that we just ended up crowdfunding it. Um, ended up raising like eight thousand dollars on Indiegogo nice. to make the film. Um, and yeah, we, we shot it in 2019, did a lot of posts on it and we ended up going to a couple of different film festivals. Shout out Miami sci-fi film fest that we went to about March of last year. Um, we actually won the best Afrofuturism award at that, nice. that festival. So thank you very much. Also best director for that too. Best directors. Hey, two of us. Nice. So I know a little bit of a humble brag, but you know, just gotta <laughs> let that be known. Hey, let it, um, let it, let it be known, man. Let, let, it, be let known, it be known, man. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I know. Show a couple other festivals. Pan African Film Festival is like the best, definitely the best nice. place that we screened it. But yeah, man, now people can watch it on Amazon Prime Video. Mm-hmm. Y'all, if y'all interested, you know what I mean? If And also, by the way, hit me up, man, because... 
you know, we're doing giveaway some Blu-rays, but honestly, I if you love Time Snap, if you're like a Time Snap sweaty, I know there's nobody who's watching this who like loves that movie. But I mean, you never know. You never know. I don't know. You know what I mean? Don't you say that. Know. You never know. Um, but hey, man, yo, if you want a free poster, I got a free poster with everybody, all the cast and crew signature on it mm. that we could give away. All y'all gotta do is just leave a comment on the podcast. Man, we still yo, wait for the nah, comments, nah, man. Nah, man. Come on, bro. Where y'all we, at? We ain't giving away no poster. You buying that? You buy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fifty dollars, a hundred dollars. No, I'm buy, well, buy, yeah, buy, <laughs> buy timestamp, but also leave a comment <laughs> for for on our, on our real talk on real ones yeah. on real ones Spotify Apple. Y'all, y'all might get a poster too. You know what I mean? Yeah, man. But check out the film on Amazon Prime. It's good. I mean, I thought it's good. You I like it. I mean? uh, if y'all want to leave some stars, just some nigga shitting on it in the comments. <laughs> So definitely, <laughs> definitely give us uh, some man, love. Man, fuck him, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't don't hate on that shit, man. Yo, go watch something else. Get out, yo. I you know I never understood that. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't like something, right. why would you leave a comment up under? It? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Me, if I don't like it, I'm on to the next. Like right. it's just like unless you ask, hey, how is it? Then I'll give you my opinion. Right. But he shitting on like you shitting on it? Nah, I'm not doing all of that. Like, come on, dog. Like I don't like it, I don't like it. You ain't gonna hear from me. You know, if you send me something, mm. like John, check it out. I'm gonna check it out. If you don't hear from me, I did not like it. Right. You know what I'm saying? That's it, because I just don't I don't. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just very much a even got nothing nice to say. Don't say it type person. Yeah, you know what I'm saying yeah. in situations like that. Yeah, you know. So. Yeah, yeah. No, man. <laughs> Just one short film you see on the profile. I'm not fucking Disney. Yeah, yeah. I'm not making like a bunch of movies. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, be a little bit selective of who you shouldn't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't yeah. Come on now, come on now. But but I'm I'm, I'm like halfway kidding. Like if y'all if y'all actually don't like the movie, I would appreciate y'all at least commenting and letting me know instead of not watching it at all. So yeah. watch the film. Yeah. Watch the film. That's what I'm saying. Watch time, time stamp. stamp. Watch you know, time if stamp. you know how to spell time stamp, watch yeah. the film. Yeah. <laughs> don't know easy. how to spell it. Just don't. You're not gonna understand the film. <laughs> If you don't know how to spell timestamp, my brother, just don't watch the film. This ain't for you. Go watch some cartoons or something. Right, right. You know, but um, yeah, man. So, yeah. So, I, what do you think the future of Afrofuturism is going to be? Man, I, I mean, I think there's going to be so many good stories. I think, for one, I think, um, I kind of mentioned before, but hopefully a more positive spin on yeah. Afrofuturism. You yeah. know what I mean? I think there's uh, so many, like I said, like stories of people traveling back to slavery or plantations there's that other stupid movie that came out with Janelle Monet. Oh, um, Antebellum. Was, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. That was can can I just get a minute? You know, I just finished saying, you know, this yeah. got nothing nice to say. <laughs> I love Janelle Monet. First of all, let me get that out of the way. Mm. I went into uh, that film was such trickery, man. Because I went into that film. Uh, first of all, let me get this out of the way. I'm not, oh, I don't like black trauma. I'm not that person. Especially when I understand what's going on politically, how they're trying to take out slavery and uh, and things that happen in history. Yes. They're trying to retcon shit mm. from schools. So we need we need anything, media, something to remind people of the horrors of slavery, the civil rights movement. Mm-hmm. You know, all the good stuff that we got now is cool, but we ain't forgetting. Just like they don't want us to forget 9-11. They don't want us to forget this. Mm-hmm. They don't want us to forget Memorial Day, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So we got to remember our history. Mm-hmm. So I went into Antebellum. I saw the trailer. Mm. I seen she was in the the cotton fields. I seen the plane was flying and the plane glitched. I was like, right. yo, what's, what's going, going on? on? Right. Yo. So shout out to my homegirl Rosalyn. She's the she's the wild Janelle when they stand. She um when it came out during the whole lockdown, because remember I was waiting for it to come out in theaters yep. and it got quiet. Yep. I didn't know what happened, and then the lockdown happened and then it hit uh VOD. And she sent it to me. She she rented it and sent it to, or, or bought it or rented it. I don't know. But she gave me access to watch it. And man, what was that, dog? Like it, everything that it promoted, it was not the film. Right. That's literally not what happened. Right. 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 Like okay, like yeah, she ended up on in a plantation. She was you know a, a, a she was like a self help guru or something like right, that. Right. Right. Ended up on the plantation. It has like some supernatural thing. You had the white girl in the in the old yeah. dress. Like, but then. They reveal it's like really that, modern time. Spoiler, spoiler alert. Either way, the movie ain't that great. No, yeah. Whatever. Sorry, I didn't mean to just spoil it for y'all. Yeah, no, no, no. Spoiler, because I don't want y'all to watch it. <laughs> Sorry, Janelle. I don't want them to watch this film. But then she she does what she has to do to get out of the plantation, I guess. And it's revealed that she's on a civil uh, civil war reenactment land. Right. Like, yeah. 
I'm like, yo, what? What? Is- like, what was the point? What was the point for everything? There's literally black people getting raped and murdered yes. in his movie. And-, and it's all on a, on a reenactment. <laughs> it's all part of a civil rights. I, I don't know, man. That, that it was such it was so misleading the way that it, they could have it yo, it could have been so interesting. Yeah. If they somehow some time trap, something, yeah. Yeah. some angle. It mm-hmm. would have been so interesting. Mm-hmm. But they just they shit the bed at the end, man. Well, yeah. I don't I don't know what that was about. That was one of the worst movie experiences I've ever had in my entire <laughs> life. Like that is honestly Seriously. Yeah, it, I, I walked like I literally was viscerally mad like when that movie was over. Like, yeah, yeah, I I really I wasted and it's it's not long, but I still wasted a whole lot of time. I was bro. like, I could have been doing something else. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, that's Antebellum, folks. If you yeah. do want to go check it out, a, it's you. man, I hate. To, oh, I think it was two directors. It was a a, yes. a, a white man and a, and, a, and a brother. But I'm like, yo, man, really? who, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, who? I don't know, man. I just hate seeing that. I just hate seeing it, man. <laughs> who like, made the call on that one? Which one was it? Who, <laughs> who was steering the wheel on that story? You know. <laughs> Did the brother take it? He was trying to take it in. The white man was like, oh, no, come back over here. What, what happened? Because it, it just went nowhere. All right. She's on a, a real... I, I just couldn't believe that reveal. Like like you said, people are being raped, mur- murdered. Big time slavery ting guan in that film. <laughs> and it's all on reenactment land. Like It's just crazy. like in the middle of a... Uh, the, Nah, it was which, like in Atlanta too. It was like somewhere a lot of black people was at. Like, yeah, which is real, by the way. It's real. It not, is real. Not, not the slave part, yeah. but there is a lot of civil war. You know, weirdos. You know, the white people. They they can't they can't take L's. <laughs> right. So they they reenacting the civil war. What the hell? It's twenty twenty three. What the hell? Are you reenacting that shit is over. Yeah. It's it's done. They didn't win. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. But yeah, man, Antebellum. Damn, I forgot. I, yo, I low key forgot. Bro, this shit was yeah. forgettable. Yeah, that shit. Yeah, so I'm hopefully no more movies like that. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like hopefully. Oh, did you watch the Kindred show on FX? I did. I did. I did. I heard it wasn't good. It wasn't the best. Nah, mm. it wasn't the best, and um, it just wasn't. It wasn't the best adaptation of that book. I love that book. I've been reading that book mm. for like a good minute. Um, it just you know. If it does a lot of stuff with the modern times that is like, uh, you know, like, mm-hmm. I don't know. But it, I, I definitely want um, there to be a movie version of that of that book. Mm-hmm. Or if not a movie version of that book or a direct adaptation of that book, at least like some, you know, some sort of reimagining in, in, a, in a sophisticated way. Mm-hmm. Because one thing, there's a couple of things that, well, for one, um, I didn't mention this before, but uh, low-key, that show Watchmen... Even though I don't know if I yeah. specifically consider it Afrofuturism, but it's real close because yeah. the uh what Regina King is dealing with in that show, Louis Gossett Jr., mm-hmm. the whole um idea of like generational trauma, mm-hmm. um generational and then also I guess it is kind of Afrofuturism because it's yeah. in a future where black people are getting respirations. Yeah. So it's like yeah. the, um so I was gonna say that to say like, and I they even they even touched on the Oklahoma City, um, Oklahoma the Tulsa, City Tulsa, the Tulsa, yeah, the, the black it. black black Wall Street. Yes, yeah, yeah, cause, yo. There's a lot of people that did not know about it until Watchmen came out. Yes, yeah, I was surprised. Yeah, and, and you know, and um, even and that's why, and even um, the guy who made it, Damian Lindelof, he read it from reading some readings from Tallahassee Coates. Mm-hmm. Um, and he read the article. I guess it came out like 2014, and just felt moved to like write. The show based around it, but that's to show you the importance of history and the importance of representation, and how you could take, you know, how you could take traumatic uh, incidences but still make it into some sci-fi something cool with a good message. I, I do, I do kind of hope that's the future of Afrofuturism is more more movies like Wakanda Forever mm-hmm. or Black Panther and more shows like Watchmen mm-hmm. that are um, that address race issues directly and head on, but also. Um, as a bit of a positive spin to it as well. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Um, even Love, Lovecraft Country is, a, is, a, is another good example. That's yeah. more, I guess it's more like horror. This It's like sci-fi too. No, it's, the, um, it's 100% sci-fi. I think yeah. there, there was there's like maybe a couple episodes that was kind of horror, horror yeah. you know, but it definitely deals with sci-fi yeah. a lot more. 
Yes, yes, yes. I hope that that that's another show, man. I hope they bring that back. <laughs> they definitely got to bring that one back. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, they could bring it back because what's his name dies. Boy, the Michael end. K. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His yeah, he passed no, away. No, no, not Michael K. I'm talking about the character. Oh, oh I'm talking yo, about, um, yeah, 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 yeah. His character. Yeah, his character. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, but I guess there's too many reasons to not bring it back. <laughs> 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 I never really think Shit. about it. Like, hey, man. Man, the, man, the dad died. The main yeah, actor died. Yeah. Jo- Junie Smulet, who even like you know. She, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, she she kind of had some momentum. She had a moment, but yeah. then I don't know what happened. Yeah, she right. just disappeared. Right. It was yeah. like what the hell? Like, and I always did like her. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So it was mm-hmm. like, oh, cool. She's about to get started up again. You know, the show was hot, and then mm-hmm. that was it. And she was also in Birds of Prey. Uh, yes, too, and uh, Canary in that movie. Uh, unfortunately, the DC the DCU ended a lot of careers, man. Yeah. The DC, <laughs> DCU is a cesspool, dog. Thank oh, God. Man. Rest in piss. I'm right. so glad that shit is over. <laughs> you know, like I said, I want DC to win, but that was terrible. Yeah. Just nah, sitting man. through, just, they kept green lighting shit. It's just like, why? Like, right. uh, uh, Birds of Prey was cool. Mm-hmm. I'm not mad at Birds of Prey. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But everything else was just like. Yeah. What are, what are y'all doing? And, yeah. And they did, oh, man, they did a, um, they, you know, they did, they did your boy dirty with, um, they did that homie dirty. They did Joe Mangianello dirty, who was supposed to play Deathstroke. Um, oh yeah! Like, have you ever seen him in anything after that? No, <laughs> no. That's what I'm saying. This shit is a homie just who like... played Cyborg, uh, Ray oh, Fisher. Oh, they did him. He got super straight black dirty. right in front of our eyes. Yo, <laughs> they fin- they finished him. He's like, well, oh, thank you for exposing everything. Like, get the fuck back out of get out of here. The ass is not getting work again. It's crazy, man. Yeah, it's bad, man. You know, but... you know, black folks. You know, we can't speak up on things. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, right. Sucks, right. man. Sucks. That would have been dope. Afrofuturism film right there a cyborg movie cyborg I know they you know, you know, what's, you know what's so funny about cyborg mm-hmm. that film was out right justice league or mm-hmm. whatever film was out and everybody was like oh we can't wait for black panther finally a black superhero <laughs> <laughs> Cy- cyborg is right there <laughs> yeah we hate what finally it's like yo fam, he's right there nobody cared dog the DC was uh, are they DC EU or DCU? DCU DC. is a new joint. Yeah, I think DC is a new joint. DC EU mm-hmm. trash. Get just just <laughs> stop. Y'all ruined Batman. Like y'all just yo Zack oh, Snyder. Yeah, dog. <laughs> nice visuals. Right. Cool visuals. Everything else was not good, dog. <laughs> you can't write a story worth a damn. No. You can't do. You can't. I'm just sorry. Like your shit. Your films are pretty. Hey man, that's it. <laughs> Let me say, I like Zack Snyder. I'm a Zack Snyder fan. I don't think I don't think his movies are necessarily the worst in the DCEU. I think there's other movies around them. But Batman v. All right, let me say this: Batman v. Superman is not good. Batman v. Bad. Superman is not good. That's a bad film. Bad. The first, the first version, the first version of Justice League, terrible, atrocious for sure. Uh, the four hour version, I, I like the four hour version. You know I, I, mean? I like the slept. Version. How many times did I sleep? <laughs> <laughs> I slept. A few times before I got through it. Oh man! But it was cool. It was comprehensive, I guess. But <laughs> it's just <laughs> that was a movie. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was it. Yeah, Wonder yeah. Woman. The first Wonder Woman wasn't good. I didn't like. Oh, it. you didn't like the first one. I did not like. Oh it. yeah, I, I thought it was overrated. No, um, but... I didn't like it. The second one was bad. The second one was really bad. Bad. Yeah, bad. Yeah. She was barely in the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like Wonder Woman's in the beginning in the mall, you know, doing what she do, and then she pops up at the end. Yeah, it's more about um, Pedro Pascal and the, and yeah. the cat lady, um, and it was trying to make him like a Trump like character. Like, yeah, 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 it was. They was yeah. doing too much with that film. Man. Yeah. Yeah. That wasn't good, man. That joint wasn't good. That you know, yeah. Now that you mention it, yeah, it. Yeah, there's not a lot of DCU films that were good. The first Suicide Squad wasn't good. I liked um, it the first time I saw it, but I think that's because I came out of Batman v Superman. I was like, oh, this is better than that. Oh, I like it. And immediately, bro, when when I saw it, when it came out on VOD and I watched it. The second watch, I was like, yeah, this movie's not good, though. Yeah, yeah. It's not good. It's not good, man. They wasted Will Smith. It was just, y'all yeah. had Will Smith on board. Like, yeah. you know, Viola Davis. Shout out to Viola Davis. She's a trooper. She's still she's still cashing them checks. I am oh, not yeah. mad at you, my She's sister. about to be her own show. I yeah, think, Amanda, Amanda Waller. Waller. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, James Gunn, we could go back to James Gunn real quick. Mm-hmm. I am on board for whatever he's doing. I, I, I you know, it's one thing I, I say all the time that when you find... When you see people that are 
genuinely into the IP, mm-hmm. genuinely into something, they usually produce good stuff. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So, you know, I'm looking for I, I heard that Crypto Dog is going to be a Superman. I don't know how they're going to. Really? I, I don't know how they're going to do that. But, but I don't know what tone they're going for. But if they go back to corn, a corny tone for Superman, I'm not mad. You're not Superman, mad. <laughs> he's corny and outdated as is. Like yeah, trying yeah. to make him all serious. See, Man of Steel, it didn't work for me, dog. Uh, so like, you don't like Man of Steel? No, so I love Man of Steel. I so didn't like. The, yeah. I didn't like. I'm telling you, DCEU was whack. <laughs> fam. That shit was garbage. Like uh, I did not like. Like again, y'all ruined Batman. Like y'all right. just found a way. Batman is. A, he's like. You ever see the SpongeBob meme when he opens up the old? He opens up things. <laughs> That's the bat. That's Batman to WB and DC. Like yeah, he yeah. is the golden child. Like he, you can never go wrong with him. Like mm. last person that fucked him up was Joe Schumacher, RIP. But right, he right, gave right. us some bullshit with Batman and Robin. <laughs> ba- y'all ruined Batman. Y'all, y'all like okay. It, it, all right, Affleck was okay in, in Batman versus Superman, right. but he, I feel Terrible like he was un- yeah. Terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah, wisecracking. Yeah. He getting his ass and He's sitting there like, oh man, he's making yeah. little jokes. It's like, yeah. come on. You're dog. right because I feel like in Batman v Superman, he he took it seriously. Yeah. So then you could yeah. tell, like, he could tell, like that, even, where, that warehouse scene. Yeah, yeah. Was, that was fire. That was some. That was some joints. Yeah, that was I some wanted a stuff. solo Batman movie at that point. I knew. Right. I knew the movie was going. That movie was whack, but I needed a solo Batman movie from right there. And that's so. That's what's crazy because like Batman v Superman is not good, but the Batman parts of it are are really. Um, Really, really good. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And where whereas the Justice League, the whole movie is trash and he's trash in it. Yeah. So it's like yeah. it kind of made the whole thing. And then he popped up for a little bit in Suicide Squad too. So it even made it like yeah. the first. But I will say though, like, um I, I know I can't I can't say too much about about Flash. Oh, oh, but oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's he's fired. I said in my I, tweet. I, I said in my I, tweet. I, I, he's that's fired. He's, he's fired. fired. That's it. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Don't um, say nothing else, please. Yeah. I, I will <laughs> say. I will say. I will say. I, I responded to somebody, and I, I did tweet this too, so I'm not cheating. Um, there's a lot more Man of Steel stuff in there that you than you would expect in, in, in Flash, oh, but in a good way. In a good way. In a good way. So I, 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 I you know. If they moving on from Zack Snyder after this, like, you know, so peace. Be it, you know. Bye. <laughs> Bye. But, Go make know, another whack Netflix movie. Go do yeah. whatever you want to do, dog. Oh, your, no, shit is, your shit is whack, oh. bro. <laughs> Respectfully. <laughs> Respectfully. Hey man. Hey, I'm 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 here for whatever whatever Zach got next. But it it, it you know, it, it ain't gotta be just as long as it's not DC, like no more Zach in the DC. I, I just love how I said, you know, you don't got nothing nice. To, don't don't say nothing if you don't got nothing nice. And I just <laughs> went in on Zach. <laughs> well, listen, this is my this is my platform. I li- listen, yeah. this is my platform. This is what you know, this is hey, we're talking. Know. Let them know. This is real talk. Right. You, you, real you, ones. you having real talk with some real ones. That's <laughs> Bam. Bam. Boom. Bars. Boom. I don't even know how we end it like harder than that, honestly. That's you know it. I mean? Yo, that's how you that's that's, <laughs> that's it. you gotta slap the mic. That's how you end the episode. So yo, <laughs> this is your boy, Mr. Yes, Marin. You could catch me at Mr. Marinos M R M A R I N K N O W S. Uh you can follow me uh at director RB3. Yes, and 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 look, we're coming through, yo, this summer. We coming with some content. We oh got, yeah, we got good discussions coming up. Next month is Black Music Month, oh. so we got two episodes that we got on the docket. Mm-hmm. I'm just gonna give you a little taste. You're gonna discuss hip hop and film for hip hop's 50th anniversary. That's in August, but we're gonna discuss it for Black Music Month, and then we are going to touch on the life legacy and film legacy of Prince, one of the greatest artists of all time. My favorite artist in particular. RB, have you ever seen any Prince movies? Um, I I've seen Purple Rain. I've never seen uh, any of the other films. Oh, he's either. about to go down a dark tunnel, boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like some, but you know his films ain't for everybody. So mm-hmm. it is what it is. But we gonna we gonna check it. We gonna talk about it again. This was episode six of the Real Ones podcast. Thank you to Stefan Bristol. We discussed future Afrofuturism. See you yesterday. We will see you when we see you. Peace. Coming soon to a theater near you. Coming soon to a theater near you.